All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, my guest is the man behind Book Break, our producer, Sean. And we are here because this is the 50th that you have been producing. So we thought it would be nice to do a little history on Book Break and also bring you out from behind the curtain, so to speak. It's the 50th with this fancy schmancy setup we have right so we we you can't really see it from where you're all at but we have a recording interface i have the laptop set up here and normally when claire has a guest i'll be closely following on the computer and you know looking up anything that needs relative fact checking in the moment um and then once that's done i take it back to a cubicle in a faraway land and then uh we edit it. We put it all together, put the images in there. Um, I like to overlay the book covers while they're talking about it, because then that way you can kind of get a better glimpse of what that uh, what that cover looks like instead of holding it up and seeing the reverse image of the of the cover. Right. Which drives me crazy. Yeah. 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 So, so that's just how this camera is. It's a it's a it's a 360 degree meeting camera. So everything you see is going to end up being sort of in reverse to some extent. So it looks like I'm to Claire's right or to her left on the screen, but I'm actually to her right. So it's kind of a it's a little tech fact for you. That's right. <laughs> and also you do like a separate audio recording because yeah. we do this on three formats. We have it on YouTube if you want to watch at your leisure, whenever. Um, Facebook Live, we go live. Well, we have the recording go up. And then also you can download through the podcast. Yep. So we have, we're signed up through a subscription or a distribution service, more or less. It's what it does is we upload it to this central hub and then it it disseminates it to things like Spotify or Apple Music or anywhere you get your podcast. I think it's on Stitcher too. So really you can find GPL Book Break on any major podcast um, provider. Right. And uh, so, you know, we, we try our best to get to, as much reach as we as we can. Right. We try to make it accessible for everyone. Yeah, and and it, when we have it on Facebook, we actually have subtitles. Yeah. Too, so. so Facebook auto generates subtitles, which is nice because it's really hard to do, especially in like this unscripted format. Right. You know, uh, that would take a whole nother day of editing. And not that I wouldn't do it. It's just I got to go on desk. Right. Right. We got other duties we do here as well. <laughs> you know, that's extracurricular. So um, what would you say is our most popular who do we get the most eyes and ears from? It's interesting. Women yeah. in, in the demographics, um, probably middle aged to older women. Okay. Um, every now and then there's kind of a weird outlier for something that bumps us somewhere. Like but what? I, it's like occasionally, well, like when I track those statistics, I see something from like another country and go, huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like what, what brought that on? Yeah. We had one episode that had over 10,000 downloads. <laughs> it was November of 2022, and we have yet to figure out, like... What was the topic? It was just, like, one of our... You know how we do a roundup of oh. reads? It was a, a November reading roundup. Oh, my gosh. I wonder if it was, like, the bot farm. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, like, Podbean put an ad out in Sri Lanka or something like that. Right. Uh, and we ad- <laughs> and everybody just listened to that one episode. That's funny. Yeah. Because our most popular one on um, Podbean was the Books About Books episode yeah, that right. I did with Stephanie. Yeah. And that had like 112 downloads. Uh, what causes people to go crazy on YouTube is the word cozy. Mm. So our cozy mysteries, 194, you know, views for, for the newest one. That's pretty good. 147 for the other one. 47 views for cozy fantasy. So um, guess something. how many books we've discussed. I should know because I've looked at every one of them. I know. Um, I'd say at this point, well over 500. You're right. Yeah. Well over 500. Yeah. 569 because, yes, I'm an obsessive weirdo to keep <laughs> an Excel spreadsheet about that. Oh, see, that's a good idea, though, because then, well, if we if we start to backtrack on a book too many times, right. you'll know at least. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. But... Yeah. Like, I know there have been a couple that have been mentioned twice. Do you keep track of how many times they're mentioned? Yes. What's the most frequently? I bet you I know. I bet you it's 
uh, fourth wing. Uh, probably fourth wing. Okay. You know who? What else has been mentioned a couple times is that um, the one written by the lady, the memoir about the Japanese breakfast lady. Oh, crying in H Mart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A couple people have talked about that one too. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So I was in Toronto recently, and I actually saw an H Mart. Really? Yeah. And I was like, oh man. So I went in there, and it's everything she describes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a uh, it's a departure from Wegmans to be sure. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So originally this started, thank you, COVID pandemic. And we found that most people kind of liked listening, liked hearing what we recommend to read. And it's just another way for us to do our jobs as librarians. So we've kept yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the podcast boom of that 2000 to 2001 when everybody was inside i mean i think it makes sense that libraries kind of hopped on that trend mm -hmm. you know the, the the relevancy discussion is always at hand and i think one of the major things we have to do as an institution is figure out how to engage the public outside of the building right you know and hopefully this is just one more way yeah because you know? it's as we know Ebooks have really surged. Yep. You know, that's a huge part of what we do here, mm -hmm. you know, because we still curate and buy that collection. But people are, by the amount of holds, people are telling us this is what we want. It's wild. And we recognize that that hold list is long and we're trying constantly to to better that. So right. Hang in there. <laughs> but um, one of the interesting things for me is I had a woman come in and say that she listens to our podcast and so does her 90 something year old mother who lives in Utica. And that's another, and I know we have other kind of families that maybe don't live in the same area anymore. That's right, yeah. So it's a way for people to keep connected to connections, hearts, and minds. That's what we're doing here. That's right. <laughs> so without further ado, we're going to talk about some books today. Yep. My first one is one that I am still thinking about because it kind of blew my mind a little bit. And it was How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. And this one was a memoir, and I would say if you liked Educated by Tara Westover, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it kind of has that same vibe of a kind of patriarchal father that sends a family into a tailspin, so yeah. to speak. But this one, um, Sophia Sinclair was raised in Jamaica. Her father was a very strict, kind of very segmented sect of Rastafarian. I had no idea. Oh, this is the one you were talking about. Yes. You've, this has been on your radar for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I, I had no idea kind of what constituted Rastafarianism. Right. I mean, I think most of us think Bob Marley, sure. kind of happy, go lucky. Right. Yeah, that's not, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me the doctrine is different from how we've been presented with this? Right. Idea? It's yeah, yeah. not just people wearing dreadlocks, singing happy songs, right. you know. It's uh, very much... Like the father is in control. Gotcha. And this father was obsessed with controlling his daughter's purity, wow. their obedience, subservience to him. Um, they were poverty stricken, moved around multiple times, you know, rental units, usually one place, definitely not better than the last, right. trying to get educated. The mother did love poetry and gave her daughter a book of poetry, and that's what ended up kind of being her salvation as she started writing herself. Um, but his, like the how to say Babylon, Babylon to him was the Western world, the influence of, you know, all these wicked, horrible people. Mm -hmm. But the thing that really cracked me up was there was an entirely different set of expectations for him. Like, he would bring these women home and introduce them as, oh, your cousin or auntie or whatever. That would be someone that he was having an affair with, you know. So, obviously, even though he's obsessed with his daughter's purity, he's out there living the life. You know, for a while he lived in Japan. He tried to get a record there. He had a very volatile temper. So, a lot of times his business opportunities were cut short. Mm -hmm due to his violent nature, inability to take any feedback or anything, and he always blamed someone else. Sure, but sure. Yeah, it was, um, it was a tough read. So it sounds like it's sort of at the intersection of a rigid belief system and then societal pressure, the 
the double standards of that those belief systems sort of give birth to at times. Right. You know, we see that a lot with a lot of other rigid ways of thinking. Yeah, unfortunately, you know. it seems like a lot of, because that was very similar in um only it was Mormonism and educated. Right, exactly, right. You know, and, and yeah. not really kind of another type of system. Like, he was also kind of a prepper. Exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. which, um, and in both cases, the women getting educated and seeing something beyond their own little confined circle mm-hmm. was what enabled them to build a different life for themselves. 100%. It's like the Plato's allegory of the cave. Yeah. You know, if you don't know what sunlight is, how could you describe it? Yeah. And then once you do, you know, that's where real freedom begins. And, right. Um, stories like this always fascinate me for that reason. You know, it's kind of like the once bitten um, way of thinking. Once you Once you get the bug of, say, learning or independence, it's hard to unring that bell. Right. You can't go back. Exactly. Yeah. There's no going back. Yeah. So. So that was, um, that was something, even though it was tough to read, I'm going to think about for a while. It's challenging to read. Yeah. 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 I would, I could assume there'd be moments of bristling. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> cool. All right. But, so what was your first one, Sean? So. My first book is called A Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe by David Marinus. It was published in 2022. I grew up playing sports my entire life uh, and throughout my entire life. And athletics, feats of of athletic ability have always been super interesting to me. You know, you and I talk about football and all that stuff. You know, football is a great display of of human ability. Um, So... When I was a kid, uh, my grandparents would come to any sort of, uh, I don't know, any sort of sporting event that I, that I was in, soccer, basketball, later on it was tennis. And my grandmother would always say this one thing to me after every game. She'd be like, just like Jim Thorpe. And I was like, who the hell is Jim Thorpe? Why does she keep <laughs> saying this? You know, and then before I had library in mind, I didn't have any sort of wherewithal to think about who this guy might be. I thought it was right. some guy she might have known or whatever. So a couple of years ago, I was listening to a podcast and it was, it was something, it was like an ESPN podcast or mm-hmm. something like that. And it was to the effect of Jim Thorpe, the greatest American athlete of all time. And I was like, that's a big claim. Let's explore that claim. And turns out he might be. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of have to have a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of notes here, but it, it would, it doesn't even really do him justice for me to just recite them off off the page. So what's interesting about Jim Thorpe, he, he was a mixed race uh, Native American, born in 1887 in Oklahoma on the, the Sauk and Fox Reservation. Okay. I'm not sure where in like regards to Tulsa that is or any major landmark, but um, uh, in 1887, and um, his, his native name, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, is translated to bright path. So I thought that was interesting and kind of, um, I don't want to say ominous, but an omen to sort of the life he would lead. Yes, precluding Um, to his greatness, so to speak. Yeah, Yeah. and so if you know anything about Jim Thorpe, you know that he was an Olympic athlete, he was a a professional athlete after his Olympics, and that at one point, um, maybe because of uh, racially motivated sort of situations he had his olympic medals from the 1912 uh olympics in sweden taken away from him Uh oh because it was he was found out to have played professional sports before the olympics and at at that time there were strict rules on amateurism you couldn't do any of that yeah so whether or not that was a legitimate takeaway or if people just didn't like him because he was half native Mm -hmm. you know there was a lot of attitudes towards that at the time oh definitely you know and um but even then he he persevered you know he (laughs) he was a let's see he went on to play major league baseball for the at the time, New York Giants, Chicago White Sox, Reds, and played in the minor leagues at the same time, played semi-pro football his entire career, and then also basketball. And at one point... Wasn't he a lacrosse player, too? That, too. Wrestling. Yeah. All that. There wasn't a sport the guy didn't play. Right. And at one point, this is what's hilarious to me, at one point he considered going pro in hockey for Toronto. (laughs) 
hey, I'll think about it. Yeah. How do you have that much energy? Right. You know, here's a guy, his, his stats were like, he's 6'1", around 200 pounds at his biggest, and just seemingly indefatigable fount of, of energy mm-hmm. and stamina. Incredible. And not only did he play all these things, he excelled in them and was, you know, an award winner for these, right. for these teams, you know. Um, but his early life is very interesting because he was born, I believe his mother was native and his father was white. And his, at the time, as a way to, uh, the, the, it's, the, it's the bad word, but the word that's used in the book, it, to civilize these folks from the reservation is to send them to what was known as industrial schools. Oh, the Indian boarding exactly. schools. Exactly. So Jim was sent to Pennsylvania. Well, he was sent to many. He always broke out, went home. Right. We always managed to find a way to escape. So finally, he ends up at... Uh, the school in Pennsylvania in Carlisle, PA, where he discovers his love of football playing for none other than Pop Warner, who was the head coach at the time. So his football career, career began to flourish at that point. And then the rest is, is just accolade after accolade after accolade until we get into his later life. And after the athletics ran out, you know, alcoholism kind of took over. He was married a bunch of times. Um, you know, just fraught with problems. And he took on a bunch of menial, you know, tasks like ditch digging. Uh, what do I have here? Um, you know, he joined the Merchant Marine for a time during World War II. So wow. it, it, how the mighty have fallen. Yeah. And it's tragic, you know. Um, well, I don't think he's alone in that. And a lot of times when someone's life is dedicated to athletics, mm-hmm. it's a real struggle to try to acclimate to being a regular person. 100%. And it's... As much as with all the, with all of the pomp and circumstance that comes with being an elite athlete, it truly is an unsustainable model when you're for, for afterlife, right? You know, unless you're coaching or unless you derive some sort of, um, you know, peripheral fame from that. Unfortunately, that's what happened to Jim Thorpe. Yeah. But he was such a great athlete in general that. You know, his legacy lives on. It's starting to be a little bit more rediscovered, I think, by by younger generations or newer generations, rather. And he's got a town named after him in, in Pennsylvania. Right. An entire town. Yeah. And it's a nice looking town, too. Um, my favorite fact, though, in 1912, as he's winning Olympics, as he's being this um, a elite athlete, he also won the 1912 Intercollegiate Ballroom Dancing Competition. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> That's that. oh, Andy did have his medals reinstated in 1982. Oh, good, which I think was recompense, you yeah. Know? So, um, you know, in the, the famous I'll end with this one because I could go on about Jim Thorpe, but the, the famous anecdote is King Gustav of Sweden at the award ceremony for you know the meddling mm-hmm. told Jim that you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world, and this is him telling this to a half Native American, you know, in 1912. That was big doings. Oh, yeah. So pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Guy's got a great, had a really interesting life. Wow. I'm going to have to add that one. So my next one is called Look For Me There, and it's by Luke Russart. And this is... Russert? Russert. Like... Like Tim Russert's oh, son. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah Bills th- fans. Yes, yep. yes. Big Bills fans. Yep. So I think I talked to you about this one, yeah, but yeah. I haven't talked about it on the podcast yet. But... um. So what happens with this one is Luke is 22. Um, His dad grew up in Buffalo, very working class background, worked himself up, and he was the host of... Some CNN show. Meet the Press. Meet the Press, that's right. No, I think it was an NBC show. Oh, okay, Meet the Meet the Press. But Meet the Press back in the day was the source for anything political. You know, you would go on the show, have a panel. So he was very much in the thick of Washington politics, spent a lot of time. His wife, I believe, was also kind of in this field. Okay. Um, But they only had the one child. So fast forward 
Luke is now 22. Luke went to a very posh boarding school in Washington, D.C. that, say, like presidents, children, and oh, so forth have gone to. Sure, sure. Um, then he went to Boston College, and he and his mom and his dad had been in Italy. Now he and his mom were there because his dad went back for work, had to film an episode or do something, and they get the phone call that he had a massive heart attack mm -hmm. and died, like, in the in the film booth. Right. Um, so Luke kind of goes into a tailspin, if you will. First, he's like trying to break into the business. Like he's 22. He's graduated from college. So he starts working for the network and, and kind of starts to take a similar path. But it's almost like at age 30, he really just had a breakthrough that he really needed to find out who he himself was was mm -hmm. so he starts this year of travel um the only thing that bothered me about this book because it's like yeah wouldn't it be great to go to i mean and it wasn't just like traveling that hostels and so forth he's going to some fabulous places okay. he's going to vietnam he's going to australia he's you know hiking in peru mm -hmm. you know some of the things his mom went with him also but he's here like trying to find himself Oh, his mom was a journalist for Vanity Fair. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, in a way, it was very poignant, um, but I also really felt, A, the pressure of being the child mm -hmm. of someone famous and trying to live up to that reputation and kind of, it makes you like untethered in your own life, mm -hmm. like trying to figure out your own path. Like, okay, my parents were these two great, really uber successful oh, people man. so what am i yeah. um so i do feel like there was a lot of mental thing and it almost leads me to believe too like when you have these people that grow up in this working class background and have been very successful they tend to like give their children like all of these fabulous opportunities the boarding school yes the yeah. boarding school the, the boston college the travel yeah. the this the that and in the end, I don't know whether it it really helped him, you know. In the I don't know. It's so hard to say because everybody's path to individuality is so different. Mm -hmm. And while uh, you know, someone like me would soak that right up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't need this job. Yeah. By the way, um, you know, other they they would really want to have that individual experience. I think, and I think it's really insightful and kind of big of Luke to. To recognize that in himself, despite growing up in in you know of that esteem, right? Pretty so wild. yeah, it was a it was a very interesting book. Um, it's it's neat how even like seeing his experience with the travel mm -hmm. kind of diminished. Like by the end, he didn't appreciate it as much. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very curious to see what he ends up doing. Yeah. And, um, you know, now that he's written a book, he, he obviously likes to write. You know, will he go in that direction? Um, Did it have, like, the the underpinnings of, like, the hero's journey that he's currently involved with? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. Yeah. And I did really like, as as you and I are Buffalo Bills fans, like any mention of the Buffalo Bills, 100%. definitely, you know, Man. like he found a Buffalo Bill yarmulke when he went to the Wailing <laughs> Wall, and he's just like, where would you find this? <laughs> and that was one of his first thoughts, like when he heard his dad passed away, he's like, oh no, my father will never see the Bills win the Super Bowl. Yeah. It's like Luke, we're still waiting. Yeah, hey, yeah. Cool all of that. us, yeah. all of us are still waiting. So. But, yeah, um, we're hoping for. Well, that, that's that, that's a, that's wild because the death of a parent, I can only imagine, or the death of a very close loved one, does have very pr profound ripple effects. Right. You know, and especially if one isn't completely individual individualized, I could see how that he would embark on this. Yeah. You know. So makes no sense. interesting book. Yeah. Um, I might want to get at that one because. You know, the family was always a big, big fan of Tim. You know, his measured sort of ways of looking at things. You right. Know? And especially for, I, it makes me feel bad because I don't think Tim Russert would be as successful today in this political extreme world that we live in. Oh, definitely. You know. No, I think he was a person that was viewed as being someone you could trust. Right. 
you know, kind of like the talking politics with the guy next door. And unfortunately, you know, the atmosphere and the environment we're living in now isn't really conducive to that. I agree. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Where are you going to take a shot? That's why I don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. You can't. You, you used can't. to be able to. Yeah, it used to be standard fare, but no, right. I don't know. Well, speaking of, that's two books about fathers for you, by the way. That's interesting. Yes. Um, all right. Another thing I'm really passionate about it is the Beatles. Um, the band, the whole zeitgeist of the time, anything dealing with Beatles, I'm, I'm a complete fan uh unashamedly all right so know this going in i think i covered some un, un discovered some insight uh after reading all you need is love by peter brown and stephen gaines published this year mm -hmm. uh I was your first hold on that one, so yes. thank you for that. Yeah, no, I thought of I thought of you immediately when I put that one in my cart to order. So a lot of the books and movies and documentaries about the Beatles, it's hard. It's this is going to be sort of this isn't going to be very generous, but I feel like a lot of it is rehash. Mm -hmm. This has its moments of rehash. You know, we've been talking about them every day for the last 70 years. Okay, with that out of the way, this book was interesting because it interviewed, it, it, I'm just going to read what I wrote down here. Takes the angles of interviews and conversations of the goings on with the Beatles and, and their like inner circle. Okay. From the inner circle, the people that were involved. So you have, you know, characters like Yoko, you have characters like Cynthia Lennon, uh, you know, Linda McCartney, Mal, Mal Evans, you know, all these folks that were sort of instrumental in how the Beatles operated, functioned and dysfunctioned. Um, you know, much is made about the affairs and the, uh, the first times and the drug use and all, and all the things that we don't really see we don't normally or typically reflexively associate with seeing the four guys in the suits and the haircuts and all that. Right. You know, a very tailored image, thanks to Brian Epstein, their manager, early on. And once Brian died, that's kind of when the Beatles, as individuals, started to explore their own selves and their own ways of making music and interacting with the world. Um, and what's neat about this book is that it captures moments from each part of that that journey each part of that evolution okay now keep in mind the beatles were a band for about 10 years i've been in bands for 16 yeah <laughs> you know and so the 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 combination of timing the combination of attitudes societally and musically in the 60s you know was so interesting and i think that's one of the things that keeps them so interesting what i'll say about this book though is um and the, the insight that I'm sort of noticing about when I read these types of things is that the more I get to know my idols, the more I, I, I dislike them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And much is made about the personal lives of, of all four Beatles. And uh, part of me wants to know if I'm better off living in the fantasy realm. Right. Curated by Apple Music. Or should I take that red pill and really get to know the ins and outs and kind of explore my emotions about that. Right. Uh, I'm currently in the latter right now. I'm glad I read it At the same time. I'm trying not to let what I, what I've learned about these people throughout the years affect how I listen to their music. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Do you have any favorite music by the Beatles that you like? What's your go-to? Like, do you like earlier Beatles, later Beatles, a mix? When I was growing up, Mom liked the "Please Please Me" era, mm -hmm. Beatles for Sale. Yeah, um, you know the the young, fresh Beatles. Uh, but as I grew into more of a music listener, I really, really like the psychedelic stuff. That's like Revolver, Rubber Soul. That mid career, yeah, really speaks to me. And then 
once you once I sort of got that under my belt, Sergeant Pepper is Magical Mystery Tour, all mm. that stuff starts to take shape. And what's interesting is that the Beatles finally started to come back or get back around to what got them started in the first place with like American blues, black music, things mm-hmm. like that. You know, they did that more or less with like Get Back and uh, Let It Be in uh, Abbey Road. Um, it's amazing how much that early kind of 1960s black American soul sound influenced a lot of these, the Beatles, the mm-hmm. Rolling Stones, yeah. all admit to yep. that influence. Delta, um, you know, country and Western, all has roots in, in black music, American black music. So that's kind of interesting. And what I love about music in general is that you can have that birthing point, that, that genesis point, and in minds of individuals, make it what it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you just happen to have four dudes from Liverpool who really, when they started, had no idea what they were doing. They hardly play their instruments. And the book talks about what it was like for them to get to know themselves musically and become better musicians and all this. And it's like, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's all from the perspective of people that were involved with them at that time. So it, it's, a, it's a worthy read. Um, but to answer your question, favorite Beatles album right now is probably the re- the 2018 remaster of um, Sgt. Pepper's In Stereo. Okay. To me, it's got to be In Stereo. Because when you put these things on and you hear everything that's going on, it, it, time goes away. Yeah. You know, and it's got to be, it's got to be, um, it's got to be that remaster though. It's really interesting because I remember I was like four years old uh-huh. when they hit the Ed Sullivan show. Right. Yeah. And my parents said I dragged out my little rocking chair <laughs> and sat there and insisted on it. I mean, it's a spectacle. Yeah. You they know? just totally changed the world. And there were so many, I mean, Hermits, Hermits there were sure. so many bands, Beach but Boys. for some reason, the Beatles have become an icon. In, and in it the, holds up. Yeah. That's what's most interesting to me, you know, is a lot of the music, instinctively, what I do, or ref- reflexively, I'll compare it to like, oh, well, like John and George saying like that at this, I was like, stop doing that. Right. You know, <laughs> stop. Yeah. <laughs> you can't enjoy anything ever again because the Beatles ruined it for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that's what, that's uh, all you need is love. Yeah. I do love the Beatles. And it's you're right. To. They, um, they have a lot of things don't last the test of time, but <laughs> they don't. they yeah. seem to. Something uh, about sixties music holds up, I think, because so much is built on that attitude. Mm-hmm. But I can go all day on this, so we might as well move on. All right, all right. All right. So I'm gonna my last one is something that I'm completely nerdy about, which is birds. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. Um, a new book is called The Backyard Bird Chronicles by Amy Tan. Now, Amy Tan, if you're familiar with fiction, wrote... Um, Joy Luck Club. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So she's a pretty accomplished oh, sure. author in her own right. But in 2016, she kind of grew overwhelmed by like the hatred, misinformation. And instead of connecting online or whatever, she took a class in journaling and nature nature journaling in particular, and started watching the birds in her backyard. So this book that um, she came up with was a product of like a compilation of the best of, of like nine personal journals that she wrote and captured about the birds in her yard. Um, But what I think is so interesting is, is birding used to be it kind of still is, is uh, like people would think it was a nerd hobby, but birding is really having a moment. You know? I downloaded the Audubon app. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are finding it refreshing to, to get out, get out in nature and kind of disconnect maybe electronically. 100%. You know, so um, everyday encounters with birds can improve Overall well-being, reduce feelings of depression, anxiety, and stress. Birdsong, in particular, can increase concentration and help with stress recovery. So, hooray for birds. Yeah. Um, so, now it's weird. It's like kind of like a young millennial thing, too. Okay. So, you kind of have these old people. And, like, last night, one of the first things I did after riding six hours in the car, it's like, I'm going to get up to the lake and walk around and see what birds are coming yeah. through. 
<laughs> and there I'm finding this young dude with a beard, and he's got the binoculars. Really? You know, I got my, my camera. Where, like and, Ontario? Or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. And he's telling me what he found, and I'm telling him what I found. And Dispatches from the, from the South Shore? That's right. <laughs> that's right. But um, what amazed me about her book is, is I brought it here, but you can see these illustrations and everything are really beautiful. Are they hand-drawn by her? Yes. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think that most people that would take this journal naturing class would probably not come up with something this gorgeous How intimate and personal yeah you know that's that's the uh, that's a book that's sort of set apart yeah i think yeah so um it's like a journal yes it's exactly like she talks about the great horned owl that that lives in her woods that's and cool. you know birds that she sees where and does she live does she allude to that she or? does she lives in california okay right. so and i think she came up with like at least 40 some species you know that live just Holy in her cow. backyard and when you start adding it up it's it's pretty interesting. I'm not sure what it would be like to listen to this audio. Yeah. Because I think so much of it you really would get by looking at the the pictures For and sure. everything. Yeah, so just glancing at those illustrations, I mean they're they're super cool. Yeah. And yeah. is did Sibley Yes. Oh, okay, very good. Yes. Cool. Wow. So David Sibley wrote the foreword to this book, which I actually read the foreword too. Excellent. Um yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting and I'd say if you have any interest in birding as a hobby or, you know, looking for it, that this would be a great, great book to pick up. Sometimes I feel like, you know, we go outside, we hear birds. It's like, yep, there are birds are there, you know, and it's, but I don't, I, if you're anything like me, sometimes they just kind of, they ju they're just there. Mm -hmm. And then one day I downloaded the Audubon bird identifier app right. just because like you know i've started hearing different sign kinds of bird sound i was like oh what is that you know and before i knew it i was i had logged like eight different kinds of birds in like one sitting right and it's like holy cow you don't even notice this entire you know uh this entire civilization of bird that happens around you and it's just I every had, day, every day, and I just right. you know, and during didn't this, give it a second guess. Yeah, the spring and and fall here, yep. like where we live on Lake Ontario, it's like a huge migration path. Yep. So, like the other morning, I went up and there were like hawk after yep. hawk after hawk. I mean, it was just it's mind blowing, mm -hmm. you know. It's mind blowing, and then every now and again, I live in the city, so every now and again, I'll go home. You know, I'll leave here, get home, and there's like entrails mm -hmm. in my driveway, and it's like. Well, that hawk was here, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like everything's missing except the beak of another bird. Yeah. It's like, whoa, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> the circle of nature. Isn't it true? Yeah, there's an old saying, Gotta nature eat. is red in tooth and claw. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> Pretty cool. All right. What's your last one, Sean? Well, th this is where we take a turning point. I, we reference a confederacy of dunces a lot on this show, I feel like. Uh, maybe at least a few times. So, so, so uh, let me jump into f fiction, I guess, a little bit here. John Kennedy Toole wrote a Confederacy of Dunces, um, and if you know anything about it, it's it's it was it was published in 1980, 11 years after he died, mm -hmm. and it was kind of in development hell for all that time. You know, he he spent a lot of large share of the 60s writing this writing this book um and really to i've read it about a dozen times now it, it could be my favorite book i think okay i'm still not sure what it's about <laughs> you know it's it's what's known as a picaresque novel it's more of like a, a character study and more of like moments like vignettes surrounding like a single character, which is really funny because the character in this book is named Ignatius Riley. He's around 30, lives with his mother, has a master's degree in medieval history. The whole book is beset in New Orleans, Louisiana. Right. So New Orleans becomes a character in itself. Mm-hmm. Ignatius lives his life by this very strict and old school, rigid worldview, not one that uh, 
a 30-year-old in the 50s and 60s would typically have, especially an educated one. <clears throat> and it's really interesting because he and his mother have this super dysfunctional relationship but are totally in need of each other. You know, So there's like some codependency there. It's really funny. And I feel like I'm rambling right now because I, I really don't know where to take this conversation other than I love reading this book because of the sort of situations Ignatius gets in. So the main, the, there's one, there's, there's, there's one plot or there's one like conflict in this whole book. Ignatius and his mother get in a car accident. And because Ignatius has never lived in the world and his mother doesn't work, they have to come up with money to pay recompense for this car accident. <laughs> And he's afraid of the world. He has these grand views and, and all these ideas of what the world should be, but he's never lived in it. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll, he'll sit atop his, his, his ivory. pedestal. Exactly. Yeah. His ivory tower. And, and, you know, cast dispersions upon everybody else and how they're the real degenerates and all that. And he's so funny because he has no idea. <laughs> Hilarious. And so finally he's forced into this role as like factotum. We're trying to find any job he can to help pay this money, you know, get this money. And I'll kind of, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to leave it sort of dangling like that on purpose because I, I would really encourage everybody who hasn't read it to read it. If you've ever felt like you're losing touch, if you've ever felt like you're unsure of where you are in this grand scheme of this world or this, this meat space, Read this book because <laughs> it will be very centering. <laughs> and it's, it, you're going to have a laugh the entire time, too, because you just cannot believe where, who this guy is. This whole time, I've read it a dozen times, and I, I have always asking myself, who is this guy? Yeah. You know, and so the mystery that could be ourselves so much of the time, I think, is manifested in Ignatius Riley. Well... And you're not the only one. This was, you know how, remember, PBS came up with that list of 100 yeah. great books, yeah. American books you need to read. This was on that list. <laughs> it's, and I can see why. And every time I read it, it's different. Because I think it, it touches on the, the reader's like personal sort of views on the world. So if I'm ever feeling misanthropic, if I'm ever feeling you know, cynical, I know it's time to read this book because I know that my worldview needs testing. And I'm turning into like an Ignatius Riley. And I need to reality test a lot of the things that I'm thinking. So that's, I'll leave it at that. But that's kind of neat that you have a book that you can center yourself with. The other one's Catcher in the Rye, but that doesn't go over so well at parties. Right. <laughs> you know, not nearly as funny. No, yeah. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. But, you know, I think because so many of us were forced to read it in high school and it right. has this backdrop of mental illness and all that. It's like, okay, yeah, I, that's one angle. But, yeah. you know, a lot of people could say the same about Ignatius. Yeah. So <laughs> I would encourage everybody to read it who hasn't. Or if you've thought about it, if it's on your stack of shame. Get it off your stack of shame. Give it a shot. And read it. Or listen to it because the narrator for this uh, is is absolutely hilarious okay there's so many characters in the book and he has a different voice for each one and it's just great well done yeah okay well I, i'm gonna have to read that i'm gonna make that it's worth like your time my personal uh <laughs> i have checked it out before and started it yeah. and was not in the right headspace yeah, right so i get that i gotta go back that makes sense <laughs> so well thank you so much for joining us sean it's nice to have you out from behind the the machine, so to speak, and yeah, get, yeah. get in touch with what you're reading and what you're thinking about. This was a good exercise yeah, for me. So Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So in summer, we only go to one episode per month, which is going to start June, July, and August um, due to the fact that the library goes... Everyone's always shocked when I tell them the library goes crazy in the summer. But yeah. um, And plus, we have vacations and stuff. So in June, we're going to have some great suggestions for beach or vacation reads, um, and thanks for joining us today on Book Break. So we always love to hear what you have to say if you want any ideas for yeah. you know, future episodes yeah. or By if any means. listeners out there ever want to be a guest, let us know. Yeah, actually, that'd be a lot of fun. And by all means, you know, comment on you know, our discussion on Facebook. I know that's a pretty good forum for that. Right. And, um, you know, just 
like Claire said, if you have any feedback about what we could be doing better or um, what sort of direction you'd like to see the show take, you know, we'll consider it for sure. Yep. Let us know. So thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.